Hello, hello. Welcome, Tech Enthusiasts, to a Wednesday night live podcast. We got a doozy tonight, a uh, topic that we've been alluding to for many weeks. <clears throat> Actually, I think even longer than that. Um, we're going to go all about Control 4 tonight. So there it is, Home Composer. We're going to look all through it. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about um, what you can do, what you need some help to do, features, capabilities. Oh, I should grab the remotes. I'll do that in a second so we can show a couple things off uh, with those. And we have a super special guest for tonight. Uh, he's been with us in the channel before, Mr. Dan DiCarlo from AudioVision. I'm going to say hello and introduce yourself. Hello, hello everybody. Nice. We'll let Jeremy get his stuff done. Hi. Um, it's great to be here tonight. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am a Control 4 dealer, and um, I'm Happy and willing to answer any questions you guys have, and we'll show you some uh, some pretty cool drivers that uh, you might not have run across. Uh, we can go over capabilities of what you need a dealer for, what you can do on your own with Home Composer, and um, look forward to all, all the questions. Perfect. So we, um, I just put up the video this week. Um, I think it was Monday. Uh, the kind of the touch versus non-touch that, that had a lot of questions, and even really since then, too. I've done, um, I spent a couple hours the other night really going through, kind of setting this thing up more fully, um, <clears throat> specifically with custom button agents and really, really thinking about scenes and kind of trying to take my Control 4 programming to the next level. So we'll definitely have some conversation um, about these tonight. And if anybody has questions about the remotes as well, uh, feel free to ask. Um, Ask away. So as usual, with all YouTube live streams and podcasts, um, you know, we'll be keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, if you have questions, feel free. If you would like to accompany any of those questions with a super thanks or a super sticker um, and make a donation, um, absolutely feel free to do so. Always very much appreciated. Uh, we'll try to get to all the questions. If there ends up being a lot, then, of course, priority will get given to uh, given the super chats and we'll go as long as we've got stuff to talk about and people are hanging around and having fun and uh, and again asking asking those questions so I think it might be worth um, kind of starting off with a little bit of an overview of my setup because we're kind of like again you're kind of using this as the basis for the whole thing hopefully the screen is nicely visible um, in the share there <clears throat> but I uh so we've been in this house literally almost 10 years to the day. And I know it's been a decade because we're at the point of home ownership where basically everything's breaking. Um, and we should have sold it in year nine and built another one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but we did a lot of automation, right? And at the time, we're talking 2012, uh, really like, you know, we had Crestron around back then still. We had Savant. We had it's probably AMX or the another one that... that may have fallen by the wayside a little bit, but like I chose control four largely because of a combination of its capability and it's at its price point, uh, price Crestron Savant and all those are more expensive options. And we didn't quite have other things in the vein of smart home. There was no Apple home kit 12 years or 10 years ago, 11 years ago. <clears throat> so control four was a pretty solid pick. <clears throat> I think based on, you know, particularly on what was available. And again, it's price point. So we've, we've ran our system this whole decade really with one controller. I think we're on our third controller. Um, we have an EA5 right now. And what, what the precursor was what the HC800 at the right, right. model. Yep. Um, and I think we might have had one before that, or that might have been the one we started with. Uh, we probably started with an HC800, but we might have had a secondary one in to run a second room. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we did a lot in the house. <clears throat> we've got, of course, the two zones of AV, the living room. So the TV, the audio, and all that stuff, um, Apple TV, Kaleidoscape in there. We've got the theater, of course. Um, it's video, projector, audio, and all of that. Um, but around the house, um, I don't even know how many lighting zones we have. Probably M most every room in the house is control for lit, um, except like the bathrooms and a couple of zones where you know, it wasn't really necessary. Um, our garage doors. Uh, we have some motion sensors outside, uh, the ceiling fans right above me, and in the bedrooms upstairs. Um, our alarm system ties in, sub pump is tied in, 
uh, we've had the HVAC in and then out and, and kind of do to put it back in again. Um, there's some complicating factors there because we have a geothermal system. And so, you know, any old thermostat doesn't necessarily work when you've got a heat pump oriented system with attachments and things like that. Um, I'm trying to think what else is in there, but we'll, we'll kind of go through the setup and some of the structure and all that. And of course, Mr. Dan DiCarlo was there from the very beginning, the original integrator installer and that of all of the systems uh, that we put in. We started with the SR260 remotes. We had that dark ages, uh, as I would call them, with the Neo. Yep. And, uh, and then now we're back to hot and sexy, new and sexy with mm -hmm. these payloads um, in terms of, uh, terms of remote controls. <clears throat> um, so what, what would you call this system in terms of the, the scope of all of your control for setups? Am I kind of in the middle? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty full featured. So you, you're doing a lot of control across a lot of different categories. <clears throat> um, there's always something crazy and bigger, but you know, those aren't, you know, we don't do yeah. nearly as many of those as, as we do your size house, which is right in our, our wheelhouse of you know, the bulk of our jobs. So um, <clears throat> you are um, more hands-on than most of our customers, which is great. Um, so um, a lot of times, you know, we pretty much have to babysit the whole thing, you know, through the whole life of the system. But um, you got a nice mix of things. Um, I love uh, your whole house lighting. You know, not every not everyone springs for whole house lighting, or you know, at least you know a lot of the main rooms and. That's a big one if you haven't done it. That uh, is just the coolest feature you can add, and really prac practical and usable too. So yeah, you, you're probably right in the in the large uh, percentile of uh, you know the the type of system you have. We we did a couple of other things as well around the house, particularly with the lighting, where we didn't have we don't have all the switches in most of the rooms. Um, right, we have. I should have took a picture of this. Um, we have in our pantry, so you come in our, through our garage, you come, you dump into our mud hall and our laundry room and stuff is back there. Just to the side of that, we have a pantry and behind the door of the pantry, we probably have like 20 light switches. So the real switches, the real control switches for various zones of the home, um, all of the different light fixtures of our kitchen, our living room, and, and many other places were pulled there. And then actually in the living room, we have like a six button keypad. So then rather than having like banks of switches in the room and not always necessarily knowing what's what, we have very clearly labeled um, six button uh, pads in that. And so door locks and fireplace as well. A couple other things coming to mind that's in there. Um, we did actually a couple of uh, super chats came in. Let's yeah. make sure to hit these really quick and then we'll start digging into composer. My mouse is going a little hard, haywire. A couple of shout outs, Julius, super original tech enthusiast. Welcome, welcome, Greg. Hello, hello. Just got two Halo touches, <laughs> not a comparison. Awesome. <clears throat> so yeah, you got to make a decision there as well. Um, I really thought when when this thing first came out that I'd be all set with these, but I, I have to admit it's it's just well per the video, it's very big. There's a lot of buttons, many of which are not necessarily as useful as I thought that they may be. And tinkering around with some of the capabilities on this, um, I think we've already kind of talked about it actually to end up keeping. Keeping the touch, keeping the touch. I think a lot of folks may may find themselves in the same boat <laughs> as more of these start shipping. I so, think as yeah. as people uh, have cable boxes, that makes the original Halo almost mandatory if they want the number pad. But past yeah. cable boxes, there's not a whole lot that needs all those extra buttons. Yeah. So Greg, thanks so much for the super sticker. Otto as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I think you need touch and control for Halo Touch. So how does one get started? All right. Well, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> you'd have to find a dealer, of course. So this is not a do-it-yourself product. <laughs> However, um, it also doesn't mean you have to do every single bit of it through a dealer. Once you have it, you got, you got a lot of freedom. So uh, you'd find a good dealer in your area. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if anybody is looking for a dealer and they're not in Southeast Michigan, feel free to email me when we pin my email at the end of this. And um, I can talk to the rep in, in your town and, and, and get a couple of good recommendations on dealers if you can't find them yourself. 
Um, <clears throat> past that, it's going to depend on the scope of your system. But if we're just talking something real basic, like one room, uh, you know, a TV and a home theater setup, um, that's going to every control four system needs what's called a controller, which is the little box that runs the software and takes control of all the other devices. Um, that's actually all you really need because that's going to come with the control four app that you can use to control everything. However, um, the, the app or a touch screen by itself with no hard buttons does not make a real good experience for browsing through TV programs and, and guides and, 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 uh, streaming apps. So you're almost always going to want a handheld remote control in every room that has a TV. And that's the starting point um, with a small controller <clears throat> and uh, the app or the remote control, you're able to control somewhere around 30, 35 different devices. Um, every single thing counts as a device. Your TV is a device. Your cable box is a device. Your receiver is a device. The remote's a device. But past that, you can do some really nice basics. You can add some lighting zones. Um, you can do door locks or thermostat or pretty much any of the features, you're able to add about 30, 35 of those to a basic system. Um, going up from there, you know, the next probably most popular thing is going to be music zones throughout the house. You're going to need probably a, a larger controller to do that. There's three sizes right now. Actually, there's four, but there's three that can do standalone. And uh, the medium size is usually required to do music zones because it has more uh, digital audio outputs and streams. But it's all going to depend on exactly what you want to control. And the really nice thing is you can start out basic and you can grow it over time. Um, it's very forgiving on updates and upgrades and add-ons. And um, I've got some pieces that we got on our initial Control 4 order at my house still running after about 17, 18 years. So um, certain pieces will need to get up to, upgraded over time. But a lot of it's just going to stay and keep getting firmer up, upgrades. So that hopefully answers how you get started. Good dealer, you're going to need a controller, but you know your dealer will take a, um, an inventory of what you need and, and quote you up something custom. Yeah, so it probably would boil down to getting a console, <clears throat> getting that person over to your house and, mm -hmm. and letting them know, like, you know, th these are the things that you want in the system. Um, and then based on the structure of your home and what control elements or command points and stuff you would need they can they can scale scale your project from there <clears throat> all right so once you get set up with this stuff um it's worth noting that the uh, there's a tool that's what we're looking at here right it's called composer this is the home version of composer so i'm running this on my mac but one thing to note is there is not a mac version of this software uh, unfortunately um, right. It'd be nice to have a, a native Mac one, but there's not. So I am running a Parallels uh, Windows 11 VM here, and it does work fine. Um, I had I had a little trouble when I first actually made the switch over to Mac. Some some issues like launching a few things, but I think that had more to do with the very first um, uh, VMs on the Mac Silicon ARM chips than anything mm -hmm. necessarily with Control 4's software. But I haven't had that issue, uh, knock on wood, crop up in some time now. Yep, I do the um, same. I run I run Windows on a Mac, and um, I've been doing that the whole time. So that will work just fine if you get it configured. And so you have a version, technically it's called Composer Pro, mm -hmm. right? Um, which gives you some facility that is not available in Composer Home Edition. It's maybe worth <clears> calling out some of those. Yeah elements up front sure so what you're looking at on jeremy's screen here is it really is the exact same software that we use as dealers which ours is ours is composer pro the difference is being <clears throat> um there's a few things that are grayed out in the home version and you're not able to um, adjust or change at all one being um, you cannot create rooms add products to the system or change connections so um, in Composer, let's say we add a TV and a receiver. Um, when, when we add those drivers, you know, you have a driver for each device in your system. And that's what this list is in this tree that you see here. Um, each one of those is, is going to come with um, software versions of all the connections that are physically on, on the, um, the, the devices. So a TV would have 
um, HDMI one, two, three, and four connections and an audio out and an IR in and, you know, a handful of other things too. And when we build the program, we're actually dragging um, an, an input from one device to an output of another device, basically telling the system, this is how we physically have everything connected. Um, so those properties are not able to be adjusted in the home version. Um, past that, uh, that renaming rooms, creating rooms. So, you know, basically the, the program has to be set up and at least configured by a dealer. Past that, what Jeremy has here with the home version is everything else as far as programming schedules um how your um how your devices uh interact with each other um, a lot of the stuff that needs to be changed or adjusted over time is all available in uh composer home and what what me and jeremy do is <clears throat> if he buys a new piece of equipment um he will he'll he'll text me and say hey listen i just got a um, apple tv in the in the living room and I got it plugged into HDMI 2 on the TV and it's audio is feeding, you know, audio input three on my receiver. Um, can you make those connections for me and, you know, name it, you know, how he likes it to see it in the program. And I'll log on, which takes about two minutes to, for me to log on from, you know, my computer. Um, I'll add those drivers, make those connections, refresh the system. And then, and then he's good to go to take it from there. Yeah. So the other thing I'll, I'll add to that is um, stuff. So basically think of it from the perspective of you can in, in composer home, you can program and affect the behavior of things, but you really can't change the structure of them. Even, yeah. even within the individual rooms, like if I wanted to take something out, rename a device or even kind of like change the ordering in the list, um, those, those operations are, restricted now you can you can have control over what you see so you can effectively um have devices present and not present but they'll be in the system configuration and just not visible i have that in a couple of these rooms here we'll talk um, about kind of why that is coming up so you can see here when i click on the house basically we have one house one what would you call main i guess the, the project uh, that'd be the 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 um That'd be the floor. Okay. So, oh, got it. Um, okay. So we don't really. Yeah, house would be used for like if you've got a main house and a guest house or a main house and a pool house. Um, you can you can yeah. separate them by structures. You know, a detached <laughs> garage or, or something like that. Okay. Um, I try to keep this list, you know, as as few layers as possible because you know you do have to yeah. browse through all that. But um, yeah, that's basically it. That goes in, and then you put your rooms in after that. So we can see some of the things that are in in these rooms, right? So they're they're named by the room they are. I've got a theater room, I've got a living room, um, kitchen, office, and then a couple of like generic spaces as well. So we defined this room called inside, and that essentially defines like our stairwells and our hallways, um, and puts all of that stuff together. I've got another space functionally called outside. Uh, so our porches, the driveway, uh, things like that, the garage are kind of in the outside. We did put all of the um, bedrooms together in kind of one list here. And then um, and then just the storage room. So the room that I film in where the rack is, it's kind of the catch-all for everything else. It's where the controller is. Here's the EA5. And then all of the other kind of things, uh, bits and pieces and whatnot attached to that. So in this list over on the right here, again, we can see the devices. Every room contains devices. And there's nice iconography and such in here. You know, things that are lights look like light bulbs. An Apple TV looks like an Apple TV. Uh, PC, Xbox, Nintendo, et cetera. And so even when you access these things, um right on the remotes they have nice iconography that goes with them you know so if we look at the theater the theater has one light in it all of my cam lights in the theater are one light that's the way it was originally wired up if i were to rewire the theater lighting i probably would have perhaps different multiple fixtures or whatnot in there um there's the projector and we have an apple tv with a kaleidoscape and then i do leave 
for some time, both in the theater and the living room, because I've been in and out of different gaming systems, that's kind of been one of the things that we've left in the configuration. Even though technically we don't have all of those things actively in the config, if my um, my uh, fickleness took me to Best Buy to go buy an Xbox next weekend, I would be able to just plug it into a known HDMI and then have it in the system. Uh, but as I mentioned, when we go to a given room, we come into properties here, right? We can look at the navigator. Um, and then if we look at these lists, we can actually control what shows up in a given room. So if I want to put a PlayStation back into the system, I can just bring it back in into the visible list over on the right. So I, I try in this configuration, I try to hide everything that's not like actively being used or um, there's a, a lot of audio, different bits and pieces and, and such mm -hmm. that go into it. So you can kind of see that the top level of the classification of how a lot of things get grouped as well. Comfort, <clears throat> lights, listen. So I don't have anything in my listen lists because there's no specific devices in our setup that are for listening or music only, aside from the AirPlay share bridge kind of stuff. We'll talk about that a little bit later, probably. So, so everything the, is really based on watch. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. So the navigator is just the word, you know, that's the category they use for um, things that you're going to see on your user devices. So your your app, your touch screens, your remotes. Anything that's uh, referring to navigator, that's that's why you're able to hide a bunch of things that you don't actually need control of. They still have to be in the program over on the left, but you don't have to have them, you know, creating a big list of things that don't do anything on your remote. So also in the theater is the AVM 70. And then it's probably also worth noting too that we really try to define IP control. I really am a big fan of, of IP control. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so I think actually everything that we have right now, save for my ability to actually use the Apple TV to control volume in the living room, um, is in fact uh, IP based. So we've got a, an Apple or an IP based Apple TV driver in here. And so every, every device, the drivers are loaded by the dealer, but when you look through them, there is documentation, there's information, there's versions. And so um, every, every device usually has some type of a special properties page as well, where you mm -hmm. have some functionality that you can, you can tweak um, in terms of its operations. It might be worth noting also that particularly for Apple TV and Control 4, it's not necessarily right direct control. It goes through... Home kit, so you kind of have to put your Apple TVs in your home kit, and then you have this thing called a bridge um, that it commands. So there's some special properties you can see here. An Apple TV is added, and I have two of them in the configuration. There's one in the living room, one in the home theater. You define kind of which one um, by registration and IP address and such is controlled. Now, when I've done the other videos, I did a video. Uh, particularly, well, specific to the Halo non-touch, but it really applies to the touch as well, where I was like kind of looking at my preferred button, mapping configurations and layouts and things like that. Um, so that's this is where I'm doing that, and I showed some of this off in the prior video. So I can go through here and say like, all right, button maps. On the left is the buttons of the actual Control 4 remote, and on the right would be the operation that, the driver is provided for a given device and I can choose to map or not map and do certain things. So very specifically, if I look at the Kaleidoscape and a lot of these are like, you know, fully online two-way communication drivers as well. So we can see here status, right? K, K Strato mm -hmm. player is in standby. And actually when I clicked on the ABM 70, it's getting information back as well. Connection status connected and it's reading the virtual inputs and other things like that. So there's a lot of intelligence shared between the configuration, the command and control, and the devices that it that are make up the system, <clears throat> um, which is so, which is why we want to do IP drivers normally, if possible, because it's two way communication. So the the device is actually sending that information back to a controller, which lets um, some extra things do like um, happen, like um, <clears throat> your receiver sends back um, its volume percent right to the remote when you change volume. Uh, just some nice stuff like that. But then on the dealer end. Um, if we've got to log on and look at something or troubleshoot or adjust anything, we, you know, we basically have all those, you know, all that information coming back from the device. It's very helpful 
when we ever have to update or maintain or, or do any troubleshooting. Yeah. So I just optimized this actually the other day um, when I was kind of doing my programming suite to redefine a couple of the specific buttons for the Kaleidoscape. And there's a few things that you can really only get as well in, um, in Control 4 here. This thing, I love it. Uh, the skip back five seconds feature. They didn't put that button on the new black remote, the little mini black remote that they're giving out with the Kaleidoscapes. And I don't think that feature is also either available in the app um, if you're using the app to command it. But stuff like that I find completely um, invaluable, uh, especially as I get older and you find yourself asking the question more and more when you watch television, which is, what did they say? Yep. Uh, boom, skip back five seconds. And I also bound uh, subtitles to the DVR because I don't know if Apple holds the patent. It's one of my favorite features, the Apple TV. You say, hey, yes, lady, what did they say? And they skip you back 10 seconds. They turn the subtitles on. They replay the scene. And then after the scene catches back up to where you were, they turn the subtitles off automatically. That's freaking software genius right there. Kaleidoscape hasn't seen fit to do that. So when I do it on the Kaleidoscape, you got to hit. This is like a subtitle toggle. So usually one press goes from subtitles off to subtitles on. Then boom, boom. Now you're back 10 seconds. The subtitles are enabled. Rewatch the scene and then just tap that. DVR button is what I'm using to cycle back through to subtitles off. So one of the, I think that's one of the most powerful viewing features that I, that I take advantage of with regards to like control four and Kaleidoscape. Um, and I can do it now with the halos where it wasn't really that achievable with the, with the Neo. Um, so in Kaleidoscape even gives you custom bindings for when you're in the menu versus when you're in actual media playback, which is pretty cool. Um, should comment like the PC drivers, the Xbox drivers, these don't do, uh, these don't do a whole lot. I don't think like any of these console systems technically have actual command or like uh, at least IP command of the devices. So if you're looking right. to control a game console, what, what is the option for that? I guess you do, is it IR? Um, yeah, like the Xbox, the old Xboxes, you could send IR to them if, if you had an emitter on there. Cause you know, some people use those for DVD players, uh, yeah. same with the PlayStation, but I'm not even sure if the new consoles have <laughs> IR controls anymore. I wouldn't think so. Uh, mm -hmm. they might respond to the old code. So, but I, you know, nobody really does. I haven't encountered that. And nobody's that asking for that. Okay. <laughs> right. A moot question. So these are, these, these have to be in here so that, um, in programming, First of all, you get an icon on your remote, and second of all, the system knows where the Xbox is plugged into the system and so forth. So even when the drivers don't do any controlling, they have to be there just to build the structure of the system. Um, it's probably also worth pointing out, yeah, I see, I love this, like the Anthem. You're getting all this information, menu details, model number, uh, software versions, all this stuff <laughs> is coming back through here. Current system state volume percentages all of that um one of the other neat things that you can do when something isn't working right is that most of the drivers allow you to log which mm -hmm. has been which is pretty pretty useful so um it's worth pointing out i think showing that really quick here so if i go to this lua page i've got commands and outputs and if i go on a given device and i say log you know print and I come back here and something happens. It's just, uh, I'll just turn the living room on with the Kaleidoscape. There you go. Now I'm getting all of this data information about what's happening between the control four system and uh, the device that it's trying to command and control. This dug into this quite a bit back when the LG TV power on issues were happening, trying to understand like, Where's who's the culprit of like why the TV mm -hmm. isn't powering on? Well, it turns out it was the, the power board um, in yeah, the LG this, itself. But this is our main tool when we, when we call dealer tech support and we're trying to figure something out. Is we'll do stuff, look at these logs, and this this tells us that yes, Control Four did send the command, but you know then maybe we get an error because the device didn't respond. And um, <clears throat> this is basically how we track down that stuff. It's really difficult to to figure out those ghosts. And again, this is the home version, so you're able to get into this level of 
technical detail about how your stuff is working and and what it's doing and, and all that. <clears throat> um, let's see what else is worth. Oh, let's take a look at like one of the lighting. So our, our lighting, just to confirm as well, you know, it, it is control for lighting. It's not a Lutron system or a third party system. Mm -hmm. We did control for lighting switches throughout. And so because of that, you have a lot of command um, and configurability over the presentation and like the operation of the switches. Right, so you can see a lot, a lot of things here. This is literally just one light switch. Um, default states. You can uh, set the be. Excuse me. You can set the behavior um, of the LEDs, for like you know, are they dim? Are they off? Are they bright? Based on um, both like the state of the switch, right, and the state of the room, or the light, the light level of the room. Um, yeah, there's a little light sensor hidden on all the uh, on each light switch, <clears throat> and down here you can adjust um, if you want the engraved button on the light uh, to light up in in different ways. So um, it's easier to see when it's not lit in a bright room because it lights up the you know the engraving shows up as black when it's not lit. So if it lights up in a bright room, it's hard to see. But then also if you have you know um, dimmers in a bedroom or something. You can adjust that when it's dark in there, you don't want them glowing bright and, and keeping you up at night. So that's all um, stuff you can adjust here. These are presets here. There's actually one where you can set the 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 like the lumen curve. You know, as it gets um, dimmer in the room, you can have the buttons get dimmer, like on a mm -hmm. scale. They just there's an unbelievable amount of properties you can adjust here. Um, you've yeah. got <clears throat> click rate and ramp rate. So that's uh, click rate is when you just hit the button when you turn the light on how long it takes to dim up. It can be different than how long it takes to dim down. It's like, it's real classy having lights dim down real slow. So sometimes you do that a little slower. There's a, there's a hold ramp rate. So um, <clears throat> control four dimmers are able, if you press and hold, it'll slowly dim up. And then when you let off, it'll stay at that percentage. Um, so the default's too fast for some people, you know, by the time they pull their hand off, um, yeah. it's too, too bright or whatever. So you can slow these way down. So that ramp rate's nice and slow. All, all the properties are, are adjustable. It's very cool. Anything else out of uh, out of here? I guess we can show the Halo the Halo page. So, <clears throat> um, oh, some of the newer drivers are kind of turning over into this style as well. Um, which yeah, is any, nice anything new is is this style here, which um, is a little easier to get around. Um, so with this is this is a Halo Touch that we're looking at here. So a lot of details about the remote, the operation, its firmware, um, and so on. In terms of properties, we do have a similar property page. Here's the the three hard buttons that are on this remote. Mm -hmm. Right, the the dash 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 up top. This is where we set those, at least in terms of what their name is, and then what their what their action would be if they are bound to an action or not, and then you would actually be able to program these up separately. We'll take a look at that. Um, might be worth showing these two, like these these uh, action pages. So for a given device and its driver, right, there's certain things that you may, may need to do with it, such as perhaps pushing firmware updates or um, sending certain actions and whatnot that are built into the driver. So whatever is available to do there is on the actions page. And again, we've got that documentation page that comes. Mm -hmm. Most of them are pretty well documented, I would say. And then yeah. the, the, the LUA page as well. Um, if we go down to the living room, I want to kind of highlight this. So I had mentioned that, again, like we don't have all of these switches in our living room. We have a keypad. So, but in our living room, there's technically four switchable light sources. There's the, we have six can lights that are kind of through the main center of the room. We have accent lights that go kind of around the perimeter and shine over our fireplace and over the bookcases that are in the back. Um, there's a light uh, behind the TV, uh, a TV backlight. And then um, under our couch, we put in plugs. Uh, which never, didn't really, that was not so useful in, in reality because getting to them is not impossible. But we thought, well, it might be nice to have a plug under there in case we ever needed to use it for something. And that's switchable. So all of these switches live in our pantry, but in the room itself is a keypad. And so this is another control for specific made product. Um, 
and it's configurable like all of it. You can see some, some similar configurations because it has lights and things and you can kind of control the state of those lights. But these, these keypads go up to six buttons. Um, and so we have six operations on this. We bought the engraved uh, button caps or mm -hmm. whatever you would call them. And so um, again, instead of having a, a bank of switches five wide, which we in our house design, we never left any wall space to even support that in that room. We have just one, you know, a one gang, one box uh, switch. And so we use this, the, the top button is the main light of the room. The second button is the accent lights. The third controls the fireplace, which is also on the system. And then we get into some macro buttons. So there's a watch TV, a play video games button, and then the bottom one just shuts the whole room off. And these bottom three are really driven by programming, uh, meaning a lot of operations around the system as well in terms of actuating physical things have uh, programming uh, events where there's a press, there's a release, there's a single tap, a double tap, and a triple tap in a lot of cases. And so we'll, we'll get to the programming part um, as we go here, but suffice to say, you tap watch once, watch TV once in my living room, you're watching the Apple TV. You tap it twice, you got Kaleidoscape. Play games once is the PC. Play games twice is the Switch. And so that's all done in programming. And room off, there's a single tap and then a double tap. If you like, just want to kind of shut the TV off and stuff, you hit it once. If you're like, okay, it's late, we're going to bed, hit it twice and a whole bunch of other things uh, around the space turn off. Oh, keep hitting, moving the mouse over there too far. Um, other similar stuff in here in the living room, of course, we've got uh, Apple TV. We've got the same consoles and stuff applied. I got the Anthem STR, slightly uh, not not quite as as capable in the IP network access department as the uh, the AVM seventy because it's an earlier model and it doesn't quite have the same stuff. Uh, of course, the LG television um, has its driver. Um, and again, all IP here. Um, we've got an Alexa uh, a device in here. This is something that I started to tinker with. I bought a little Echo uh, device, uh, but I never really got too far with it. Um, I was thinking to leave the Echo more than likely in the theater and be able to like voice a command to say like, you know, put the put the system in lens memory for scope or something like that. But those operations, especially with the new remotes, are just so much easier to do off of the touch that this has been kind of dormant in there for a while. And I haven't, re I ha honestly haven't really done uh, much with it. Um, two remotes in this room right now. One is the touch, one is the non-touch. There's not really much difference between them um, other than if you go into properties on the touch, you don't have the options for those three hard buttons. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't exist, they're not there. So one noteworthy thing on the drivers is <clears throat> um, drivers will get updated, you know, periodically and either fix bugs, add features, um, support something new in the device. You know, if the device is something that updates. So um, <clears throat> some of them we can set up to auto update. A lot of them have to be done manually. And that is something that your dealer would have to do. <laughs> Um, they'll still function in whatever version they are, but you know, a lot of times there's you know some nice, you know, neat new programming and stuff you can do with them over time, and that's all stuff that can be done remotely too. So, um, if the system will require just a little bit of maintenance, you know, ongoing for updates and stuff like that, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I would say updates are pretty regular. There's a there's a regular flow of Everything from like the core OS of the controller to Composer itself being updated to all of the individual devices as well. Um, the, the Halos are kind of the first devices <laughs> that um, will update automatically. So um, <clears throat> when there's new firmware out for the Halos, they push those out um, usually in the middle of the night over the course of a couple of weeks. They'll, you know, they'll push them out slowly to all the active devices out there. Um, so stuff like that, we wouldn't have to do anything for, but individual device drivers, um, will have to update from time to time. And then the operating system itself, you know, the whole control four system will get updates 
And that's definitely something the dealer has to do. That also yeah. can be done remotely though, but that never happens automatically because it can change the behavior and functioning of the system. So it's too large to just, you know, roll out to everybody yeah. as an, um, as an automatic update. All right. And just in terms of other interesting items in here. So the kitchen's pretty, pretty basic. It covers our kitchen and dining room. And again, all of the light elements that are in there, we've got main recessed around, we've got lights over our Island. We got uh, LEDs under our cabinets. We've got a light over the sink and then a light over our table. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Those are all in the pantry. And then there's a keypad at the one entry point of our kitchen. And then there's a keypad kind of over by the kit, the table um, as well. And that's the same uh, six button keypads. And there's, I, I say I don't really do a lot of programming here. It's more a matter of like just discrete light control. Um, one of the things that I think you'll find with these systems is like they can be really smart, but they can also be not always smart enough. Um, so there's definitely some places where like something we do is driven with programming and there's other places like this where it's just like literally discrete control of these things because in these specific zones of our home, the way we use them, yeah, we could make a scene and, and we could map a couple of different scenes and whatever, but the variation of like, what do we really want on right now for, for who's here, what we're doing and what time of day it is. Um, you just can't program it, it <laughs> try. Yeah, it, it's always changing. So you can't really set one scenario that's going to cover everything for stuff like yeah. that. Um, in the office, so there's another new device here in the office above my head here, the ceiling fan. As I mentioned, those are on um, those are on our system in the rooms where we have them. So there's specifically right a ceiling fan keypad mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, switch that that the the fan is wired to. A lot of similar options, of course, as you can see here. The other cool thing is like some of the stuff too is the tracking, right? Giving you ideas of. I guess this is probably like total number of minutes the fan um, has been on. Yeah, been on yes. today, 466 minutes. Um, so this is really good for troubleshooting too. You know, if the light's not working, <laughs> we can tell by looking at this if it's the if it's the dimmer or it's the light itself. Usually, yeah, we got one of those. We got to got to have you look at because our our okay. bedroom ceiling fan isn't working. Uh -oh. Actually. And it might, I don't know, we use that one so little that, but yeah. Um, so inside more, again, more keypads uh, kind of around the house. We got keypads at the bottom. Uh, on the main floor of the stairs going to the second floor, there's a keypad on the wall. At the top of the stairs, there's a keypad. So we, we used quite a bit of those throughout the, throughout the house. Um, outside, so we've got these door locks. Um, they interestingly like the locks show up twice i guess i don't that that's a, a remnant um, so of... one is the actual hardware the one that says yale and the other one i know the icons are the same <laughs> but the other one is actually the icon that you interact with on the app uh, okay so um and then in, in um in the setup you know the icon is bound to the, the <laughs> physical lock um, <clears throat> because, uh, you might have a different lock there. You might have a quick set or a Baldwin or some other brand, you know, that's, that's the driver for the device. But you know, what you see is always uh, going to be the generic front door lock or the back door it. lock. So it backs it up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, this is probably an item that we maybe do to refresh now, 10 years later. <laughs> um, yep. We'll see. Th this is also an element of the system that we've kind of struggled with a bit um, in terms of like, sh sh should should be being able to access a lot of the advanced controls and then, but they don't, they don't, they never really worked. They don't really kind of take, um, but in any case, our doorbell is on the system as well. And that actually triggers into the house audio system, which is part of the setup. Uh, we've got a bunch of light zones outside. We've got a port, a ceiling fan on our back porch. And again, those garage doors um, are in here as well. So we have uh, we have a contact sensor on the 
on the pillars of the garage doors. It's like a magnetic sensor, right? Yeah, it's a magnet sensor. Um, so that's got a battery that's got to be changed every once in a while. But that's how the system can tell if the garage door is open or closed. Mm -hmm. um, there's what we have a dual dual system, two separate openers for the two doors, and and that detects them. And then for controlling the garage doors, right? We wired a contact relay. Yes. Out yeah, each, from the controller. Yeah, each door has a relay and a sensor. So the <laughs> sensor lets control four know if the door is open or closed, and then based on what you want it to do, it'll either fire that relay or not. So on the user end, you know, you have a garage door icon and if it's shut, it shows it's shut. And when you touch it, it opens. Um, it can do a bunch of other things too. Um, it can push a notification out if it opens, you know, even if it's a certain time. Um, if it, the garage door opens and it's nighttime, we can have it, you know, turn the light on inside the garage for 10 minutes or, um, you know, anything like that, light a path up into the house. So once something is in control four, and, it, and Control 4 knows its status, you can do all kinds of cool things with programming at that point. And then the sensors that we have, actually these need to be battery replaced. They're not functional mm -hmm. right now, um, but they're basically wireless wireless motion sensors there. Uh, just to move through the rest of this kind of quick and we get into some of the other elements of the system. So let's talk about the audio uh, really quick. So you will notice there's eight share bridges entered in here. Um, so the way that we use whole house audio here, and I, I did the I did some videos and I did the review on the MDX, the Anthem MDX. Uh, it's a 16 channel, 16 speaker, eight zone uh, matrix switch and amplifier. Um, control four, uh, a couple outputs of our EA5 audio outputs of our EA5 are wired to inputs audio inputs of the MDX. Got a couple of RCA analog audios and then a couple of coaxial audios. And we're, we, we basically airplay. Take my phone or whatever, uh, our computers, our iPads, um, and when we pull up our airplay target, we see these eight targets in that list, which let us basically directly hit uh, audio to his own. We use Apple Music. Predominantly what we're airplane is Apple Music to the kitchen or wherever we may be. Um, it's kind of a unique part of the system, right? Because these are basically virtual airplay targets that mm -hmm. the Control 4 system presents to the Apple AirPlay devices. I wonder if I can show this real quick, actually. Yeah, and ShareBridge is just Control 4's name for AirPlay. Um, <clears throat> so those show up as AirPlay devices. Yep, there they are. So there's my iPad. If I hit the AirPlay list, it's not rendering very clearly, but you know, living room, back porch, basement, craft room, etc. You can hit one of those or multiple because AirPlay 2 supports multiple zone targets at the same time, which is cool. <clears throat> um, there's the wireless contacts. Uh, these actually, I just replaced the battery the other day. So battery level 100%. Um, and then the system comes with a couple of like little mini remotes as well, but that might've been more the security portion of it. I think there is a security element, mm -hmm. all of the contact, um, sensors essentially around our house telling whether telling the security system, whether the doors are open or closed, the windows are open or closed. And then we've got these various glass break sensors that can send notices into the system, sub pump, fire alarms, uh, and so on. And then the bottom is a test room and had, had added for the purposes of tonight, um, if there's anything other interesting that we wanted to kind of show off. So that's, that's the config, that is the house and all of the various things that are, that are in there. Um, so we've been talking a lot, not a whole lot of comments coming through. Chadman had a question. How does one sync the system if things are not powering on or sequencing properly? Does this have to be completed by the dealer? Um, it, sure. it depends on what is not uh, powering up. So <laughs> um, the control four system is going to fire out all the all the right commands to turn everything on. Um, if one piece stops responding, then you know you kind of have to track down why it's not responding. Sometimes it's the piece itself. So the, the control four program won't change once it's once it's set. 
it doesn't, you know, a part of it doesn't stop working. Now this is software. So there's always the possibility something is, you know, frozen up a little or glitching and a power cycle will refresh it just like your phone or your computer. But past that, <clears throat> um, you'd have to de determine why that piece isn't responding to the command. And, um, you know, that each piece has its own quirks too. So that's likely what that would be. All right. So the, in, in composer here, the, the section that we've been exploring here has been this monitoring section. Um, I'm going to skip media. Let's cause that's not even, I don't think something that gets used all that media much. doesn't get used oh, a whole lot more now that everything yeah. is streaming. So that's kind of already built into your streaming services. Yeah, there was there was a day and time where you could use your controllers more actively for media control. Like they they had some really advanced interfaces with like the Dune players if you had rips mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and you could actually like navigate uh, a media server like on the Control Four UI. Uh, but with the way <laughs> the way we have sources nowadays, it's not uh, it's kind of almost like a remnant, I would say. It is, yeah. <clears throat> so agents. So monitoring gives us the devices and the systems and the structure in the rooms. Agents are, I, I guess, maybe last the expert. What would you? Um, they're kind of an they're... agent as. I think my audio. Test, test, test. I think Dan got muted there. Um, yeah, it says your mic isn't connected. No, can't hear him. Can everybody hear me? Uh, do I got okay? I hear you, not Dan. I bumped my I bumped my AirPod briefly there, but it held on. May need to drop and re reconnect or. Yeah, I can't hear you. Can't hear him. Can't hear you. A couple of shout outs follower while he's fixing there. Second Rick, welcome, welcome. I think that's a new name. I don't I don't remember from before. Akash, my friend, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, I don't hear me. Okay. But not I should oh, be there. Back. Go. Sorry, yeah, we're back. Bluetooth headphones died. <laughs> uh, do it. All right, so agents. The agents <clears throat> are, are kind of global uh, programming tools. So um, they each do, you know, something different. Um, they're present in, in the software. So, you know, we activate them as needed. So, for instance, um, lighting it allows you to create lighting scenes. Um, in, instead of writing code and doing a bunch of program programming, there's, you know, there's a template that lets us basically just build these really fast and really reliably. And it's, it's real easy to see what we've done and make adjustments. Same thing yeah. for any of these announcements or creating custom buttons or uh, creating macros. They're they're basically um, kind of programming shortcuts is what agents are. Yeah, so these are real powerful. And I, I would say only earlier on in my use of the system, I wasn't probably employing these enough. But now, uh, for one reason or another, I think I am using the, the, the majority of them now. <clears throat> so lighting scenes, we can see I've got a bunch of these defined. Um, I named them for the room because these names do have to be unique and I wanted to use some similar naming. So my, my convention here has been like bright, comfortable, dark, right. Or maybe some other specific light level. So in the living room, we've got a reading level. So in the levels of darkness, I kind of go bright is all on. Uh, reading is a, is a little dim from there. Comfortable is very dim from there. Dark is off. And then I've got this kind of special, if I actually let me click on one of these so you can kind of see what fills in there. And so not only too, can you add, add lights from the room 
uh, a specific room, but you can add lights from multiple rooms. And so in this case, um, this all dark lighting scene gives me the facility to say, I'm sitting in the living room and I want to start watching a TV show or something. And somebody left the lights on in the kitchen or the office, or I was in here and I walked away and I never came back. Boom, hit, hit one lighting scene and everything shuts off um, in order to make, right, make the movie dark. In the theater, um, you know, there's a bright, but then in the theater, I'm usually going between comfortable and dark. And so particularly with the Kaleidoscape, who has a lot of really excellent programming cues in the system, you know, you start playback, you're, you're at the menu browsing Kaleidoscape in my theater, we're at comfortable, 20% dim level on the light. Um, but you start playing a movie, it's going to go dark automatically because the control force system gets the trigger, trigger and I've got the programming set up. But you pause, um, you hit the end credits of the movie, you hit the intermission button, right? It'll, it'll jump it back and ramp the light back up to this, to this comfortable level. And uh, so gaming is to me in the, in the theater is kind of like reading. I like to watch movies in the dark, but when I'm gaming in the theater, I usually leave the lights on at least a little bit. Um, so that's what a lighting scene lets you do. And then, you know, you can see this header here again, all kinds of options, um, options and power and flexibility in, in that um, announcements is how we get the doorbell. Mm hmm. Yeah, doorbell's the, the thing we do the most with announcements, although you can have announcements <laughs> play for anything. So I do have, um, like we just programmed, uh, it was a commercial site, but um, when they're on the upper level of this, this structure and either of the doors open up, we put a contact sensor on each door. And when it opens up, we had it play through the upper speakers. Um, hmm. It's kind of like um, an old um, like dime <laughs> store uh, bell that it would be on a door from like, you know, an old store. So that way he knows um, when somebody came in through the door. So announcements can be anything. Or the, another use case is um, swimming pools. You're um, <clears throat> sometimes for code, back doors leading out to a swimming pool have to sound some kind of chime so that the you know the grownups know if a, a child went through the door. So we can program stuff like that to happen. And announcements can play through any audio zone, any or all of the audio zones. So that's all. Um, configurable too. So when we do a doorbell, sometimes we will have it play in the main areas of the house. If there's outside backyard patio speakers, it's great to play a doorbell through there. So you, you know, which is something you normally wouldn't get with a real doorbell. And then in like master bedroom, we might either have that play real quiet or not at all, but you know, in an adjacent room, we'd have it play. So it doesn't disturb people. So all that's configurable. So the custom budget budget custom buttons um, is another one that I've done more much more with lately although a little bit since getting getting the halo touch so I've got custom buttons uh, screens in in both the theater and in the living room now and so this is the one uh, in the theater that I use for aspect ratio control right? still mm -hmm. using lens memory settings zooming up uh, into different different modes for the scope screen. So I've got four different uh, lens memories that I switch between in there and then quick access to get to like video info overlay on the projector in the living room. This one is kind of like another, I call them both modes. Um, but the one, the one main thing that I use the custom budget, custom button agent for in the living room uh, is switching the TV between modes. Um, and really this is, relegated to the Apple TV because we both watch a lot of content on the Apple TV, but we also game on the Apple TV. And so I want a quick way, uh, if we're going to play a game, to be able to throw the TV into game mode and then put it back into video mode. So if I go here, um, right, we only have to go onto the screen here, go to modes, and then there are the configured modes from the custom button agent. And that's, that's really good for um, if you have a lot of commands, you know, up to six <laughs> commands, but you don't want six icons, you know, clouding up your, yeah. your touch screen. It's just going to show the category as the button. And when you touch it, it opens up and shows you the command. So it's a real clean way um, 
to get a, a lot of functions on on a, a small space. We did already did the advanced lighting as well, but I should call out. You can I I favorited uh, scenes, so that middle button on the second row is the lighting scenes. You tap that, and then you get quick access to your scene. So if you look behind me, boom, there's bright. There's reading and so on. I'll turn the lights all the way off to dark again. <clears throat> so you get per room, you get four of these menus up to six buttons each. And what they do is entirely based on what you set in the programming. Um, there's some email notifications, which might have some email addresses that I maybe don't want to share on YouTube. But suffice to say, you can get notified about stuff that's going on in the system, right? Um, so macros, here's another one that's pretty cool. I have a couple of these. So a macro is just a way to, to absolutely define like a block of custom programming. And you can insert macros into any of the other programming options all throughout your code. And so these are defined just by name here, right? You can add and delete them. Their programming is set in the programming session. And we'll take a look at what those are what those are doing. Um, scheduler is also an interesting one. Um, I have this is several, almost ten different schedule triggers defined. Um, so the system knows your location. It knows like weather and time. Um, so. I've got three evening events defined, 8 p.m., 10 p.m., 12 a.m., which kind of do different things in terms of like starting to kind of shut the house down, uh, make sure that we never go to bed without the door locks locked, stuff like that. There's a sunset event, which is one of, I think, the little cooler aspects of the programming. Um, we'll get to that. I should talk more about that when we get to the programming. A morning event as well. And then these last four are kind of in here. I guess this is how your drivers and other things get updated, right? These are yeah, those kind of come already preloaded when when you uh, create a system, and uh, they're using this agent to uh, keep the auto updates going every, and checking and, and executing every day. And then a timer. I've got one timer set. Uh, we use it for our fireplace because what we find is that we run the fireplace too long in the winter time, um, and we kind of like overburn it. So just to like make sure that it never gets left on too long or, or, you know, heaven forbid as well, that maybe we leave or somebody leaves the fireplace on. Um, when you turn our fireplace switch on, it invokes a timer set for 30 minutes. And when the timer expires, the fireplace shuts off. So um, it gives us kind of that peace of mind that we'll never leave the fireplace on. And even when we're here all day long, We'll turn it on, it'll burn for a while, it'll stay hot, it'll still circulate some air, and then it'll start being a little chilly again. We'll go turn it back on and, and kind of run it as a run it as a cycle. Um, I don't think I have any variables, but they're right now. I did have some variables um, when I was using this guy because it has limited, more limited buttons. And so I wanted to be able to like have a button that would like switch uh Actually, the game mode, the game mode and the video mode of the living room, I had on a, uh, a single button to toggle between game and video mode, and the current value was stored in a variable. So it's basically just kind of like regular conditional programming, right? If the state of the variable is currently game, switch to video. Else, if the state of the uh, variable is currently set to video, switch to game and and now you've got a button that can go between two different states. So the the touch setting up the touch remote nullified the need to use the variables that I was using. Uh, but you can use them for all kinds of different stuff uh, like that, holding state and so on. OK, programming. And I'm really surprised there's not a lot of questions. Um, if you've got some questions or something specific of the element, that uh, you want to see, fire those comments out. Let us know. <clears throat> All right, so last section, the ma main component section, third major section of the composer is programming. And this is really where the, the logic is defined. 
um, you have the ability to do so much in here. So if we look at this screen, right, we have the, the left is the, is the programming in the events that you're defining operations for. The middle is the script that defines the actual program of the thing that you have selected. And then on the right is all of the actions that you have to choose from. So if I just look at some of these programming things, um, let's talk, we'll start with the theater because it's the top room in the house. Um, so theater, right off the bat, if you click on the room, it has events. So the, the theater room itself has an event for power off, audio selection changed if you're going between different listening sources, or video selection changed if you're going between different, um, <clears throat> different watching sources. So this is one of the things that I do right here. How, when the theater powers off, if it's nighttime, activate the lighting scene downstairs on. So what that means is we're sitting in the theater. The rest of the house is off. It's dark or whatever. We finished our movie and we want to go upstairs. But if we leave the theater, we're in the basement. It's going to be pitch black and we're not going to find our way up the stairs. So if we're in the theater and we power off the room to leave, if it's nighttime, meaning um, sunset, fundamentally right i think before and after sunset defines the nighttime variable mm -hmm. um turn on those lights so we never leave the theater without the lights to get back upstairs kind of already illuminated and so i believe that nighttime comes from the timer or not timer uh scheduler yeah. scheduler yep so if we look how like i built this right it's a the the actions on the right there's commands some things have commands, um, some things don't. Some things have conditionals, some things don't. But here's all the conditionals that you can get with time, right? If the time, meaning the day, the date, the month, the year, or the physical clock time is equal to or less than or greater than some threshold, right? You can define uh, that in the programming. You can define time to be in between certain ranges or within certain ranges. So I notice a lot of people do stuff like this. They'll do like um, 30, it's not taking my keyboard. You know, they'll do whatever, say like 15 minutes before sunset. So instead of this one just picking nighttime, which is sunset, you know, you could you could skew it a little bit before. If we're within 15 minutes before sunset, then still, you know, do this thing. And you can compound this stuff up as well with else's and ands and ors and, and so on and adding delays and whatnot. So right right off the bat, like this is one of the, the useful little bits of programming that we do uh, in the room. The other one in here is, again, like so if when the video selection changes in the theater, again, like I mentioned, we use like I use this comfortable scene a little dimmer just when we're browsing the Apple TV, we're browsing the Kaleidoscape. But if we switch to a gaming device, I want the lights just a little bit higher. Um, and so that that's how that's done in there. And so the question mark is a conditional. The arrow defines an action. Um, let me see what else we've got. So Apple TV, right? What can you do with an Apple TV? Well, you've got power on, power off events. And then we've got play, pause, and stop. Um, so still using an Apple TV, you can have reaction in uh, the lighting system. In prior versions of the Apple TV drivers, there actually was state communicated and some intelligence between the Apple TV and Control 4, but that, that fell by the wayside some time ago. The one thing to keep in mind is that if you want these to work, you have to use the transport controls to play and stop because they're really kind of triggering off that button when that device is active. If you just use the OK button or in menu or back, you won't get the, tri the same trigger for the lighting scenes. But Kaleidoscape, Kaleidoscape is really where the power comes in. So if I go down here, this little jump list is all of the custom uh, sequences, events that can be defined for a Kaleidoscape. And so you have cinemascape modes, which has, I think, more to do with like um, uh, masking systems and stuff like that. I don't use any of those. You can actually <clears throat> trigger off of uh, video information, <laughs> color depth, sampling, 
color spaces and so on. So maybe like, you know, if, if you really needed to customize the settings of your projector based on the video levels of something being shown and, and, you know, it didn't just happen automatically, you could trigger off that again in and, and our HDR as well. Again, I don't use any of those. So the ones that I do use though, are down here at the bottom. These are the four money, um, items I would say for Kaleidoscape, right? So lights at end credit level. Um, so th this this is just phenomenal. Everybody loves this when they watch a movie. You're sitting there, the movie's ending, it's winding down, it's switching to the credits. They, they've they analyzed every single movie in that store. They, they know the moment when they define the credits to be starting, the trigger gets sent, the lights just come on naturally. It's like literally being in the movie theater. This little thing is like ambiance and elegance um, you know, superb. <clears throat> um, astute folks may inquire, like, why do you have so much conditional around there? Like, why don't you just put the lights in a scene when you hit the credits level? And so I've got conditionals in here because I share the kaleidoscape between both rooms. Um, we use it in the theater, but the zone two HDMI of my AVM 70 routes to the TV in the living room. And so I don't want, for watching a movie in the living room on the kaleidoscape, I don't want the lights in the theater going ping ponging all around. Um, so only if the theater is on and the theater is actually using the kaleidoscape based on these triggers, should it affect the state of the lights. So we've got end credits level intermission level, which is another like special mode you can engage in kaleidoscape. And then basically what they define as menu level, right? Is when you want the lights on cause you're browsing movie playing levels when you want the lights dark because you're watching this stuff. And then at the bottom, um, these triggers are sent based on starting a playback of a movie and its aspect ratio metadata information being sent to the control four system. Um, you can see I've got some stuff disabled in here. This is kind of one of those things that like it's really cool until you don't want it to be constantly changing the lens memory of your projector on you. And then it's a total pain. And if, uh, if I didn't have a, a YouTube channel where I was like using my room for the purposes of recording and demonstrating and, and messing around so much, then I probably would have these enabled. This is actually a cool feature as well. Just the, the mere fact that I can um, enable this item, right? I don't have to like delete it if I want to suppress something. I can just uh, disable it. But what I found is that I'm okay manually putting the projector in the right lens memory. Hence, again, the reason that in the theater I have a custom button agent that I can very quickly access on the remote to do that. Because if I'm doing a bunch of demo scenes back to back and I'm going between the menus and the UIs and the, and the content, it's constantly like zooming in and zooming back. And it kind of is a little bit of a pain. But um, in terms of, again, one of the like really nice aspects of Kaleidoscape is its power in terms of interfacing with a system like this. Uh, what else here? Oh, okay, here's the custom buttons for the Halo Touch. So, or I'm sorry, the, the, the non-touch. I constantly get these mixed up when I say that. Um, so button one, two, three is the definition of these three buttons right here. They're named back in the properties of the device itself, but here is where the programming is set. And again, what I was using these for was those lens memories, put the projector in a certain installation mode. So uh, Jeremy, with the <clears throat> new latest firmware on the Halo, uh, in the documentation of the driver, it tells you how to do the programming. If you're, if you're using one Halo between multiple rooms and when you switch rooms, if you want different three custom button commands, Yep, it tells you cool. how to program that. It's basically some conditionals. You know, if the remote is browsed to the bedroom, then I want this button to be ceiling fan. If the remote is set to the family room, then I want the fireplace, that kind of thing. And it'll change the name of the button and the function. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, one other thing maybe to point out while we're in here. So like if I, you know, based on clicking one of these buttons, I want to command my JVC to go to lens memory mode one. Well, I go to the event on the left that I want to program. And on the right, I go to the device that I want to actuate, right? So here's my projector in the theater. Here's its command set. 
there's a lot of commands that are just generally available by default. And then in a lot of cases, more advanced devices will have like all of these kind of like, um, well, advanced and custom commands. So installation mode is the lens memory. There you go. It has 10 of them. I can tie these tie these memory recalls, installation mode recalls to whatever I want them uh, to be part of. So other interesting programming tidbits um, in the here's the keypad for the living room or you know any six button keypad. So the events are each of the buttons, and I mentioned like watch TV, right? So we have uh, we can program independently for pressed, released, single tap, which as I mentioned puts the Apple TV or puts the room uh, into Apple TV viewing mode. Double tap is Kaleidoscape. And then triple tap, I only have two video sources, so triple tap doesn't do anything. Um, I've got a couple disabled commands in here. That goes back, actually, to when the LG TV wasn't doing everything it was supposed to do, like basically putting in a little bit of extra programming to get it right and try to hopefully get it into the right states and whatnot, but it works fine like it would be expected to. Um, I mentioned the fireplace switch, so when the fireplace is turned on, start the fireplace timer. And so if I go down here into timers, I can see my timer and I can program start, stop, restart, reset, pause, resume, etc. Or even custom define uh, its interval for a, one specific programming instance. And then when the fireplace switch is turned off, if the timer is running, you know, just kill it. What else? What else? Um, Nothing. Alexa. So I, this is where I was playing with some of the Alexa stuff. So I do have a couple of Alexa commands that I had defined, but there's really no programming behind those. Um, kitchen keypads. Let's see. I'm trying to think of some of the more interesting stuff that we that we have in here. Let me go down to the scheduler actually. So each of these each of these events. Uh, on the scheduler, let us do different things. So evening event, 8 p.m., execute the macro, security partial. And what that means is we lock a few of the doors, but not all of them, because by 8 p.m., there's probably a door that we're still using, and it would be a pain if we if it locked on us and we were outside. We just have to unlock it, but so be it. So here, here's where things get a little more interesting, I think. So at sunset, um, when the sun is setting, starting to get dark, we just turn the LED cabinet lights on in the kitchen to 35%. We basically, while, while it's dark and we're awake in the house, we just always have those on, adding a little bit of utility light in the kitchen. Um, but here, if the living room is on, then activate the lighting scene, living room comfortable. So let's say it's a Sunday after dinner, it's still light outside. We sat down, we were playing some video games or whatever starts to get dark the lights because the tv is on which is generally an acceptable indication that we're in the room doing something the lights will come on automatically that 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 alone is a, like a little really nice ambiance piece to it and then there's a couple of like scheduler based things in here if the month is december turn on the christmas lights um which are on a dedicated dedicated switch kind of around the house um, the late night event is a bigger one. So here, this one's about management of things. Uh, at 12.30 a.m., just shut those kitchen LEDs off. If we're still up, that just we probably shouldn't be. Just go to bed. <laughs> um, right. If the month is December, turn off the Christmas lights. They don't need to be on all night long. And then I got a couple of other uh, programming elements in there. Um, I'll explain them. I don't want to click off them. Um, which is like if the kids went to bed with their ceiling fans blasting, put them on, put them on low, right? If the fans are on, put the fans on low because they don't really need to go blowing high all night long. And then in the morning, 8 a.m., if the, the kills me, I don't know how many times I just recently added this one as well, like walk into the bedrooms or whatever. And like their ceiling fan has literally been on all day long. So just shut them down at eight, at eight o'clock, 8 a.m. By then, they're usually up and out of their rooms and and onto their stuff. Um, mentioned the macros. So, like, again, here's, like, the security phone, security partial, right? Just basically lock all the doors. 
So instead of individually adding these lock actuations, instead we can put them in a macro and we can put that macro where we want it to go. And then um, I like to have a button, say in the living room when I'm PC gaming to pull up the game optimizer on the LG TV. I wanna see my frame rates, but I only wanna see them for a few seconds. So living room game info, it's on the custom button agent. Um, you know, bring up the game optimizer, give me five seconds and make it go away. And if I want to, again, kind of like check game performance or check TV to game performance and frame rates and stuff, I can do that uh, easily there. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think what else. What else we do? Oh, we had a question from Otto come in. Um, I have 10 can lights on one wall switch. Can a control unit be inserted behind each can? To control them individually uh well theoretically yes but uh that wouldn't pass inspection because the light switches can't be buried um if you had to control them individually and you couldn't rewire uh then you'd probably want to use uh some something like a phillips hue where the bulb is controlled uh phillips hue works phillips has a like kind of an odd but lower priced um offshoot brand called Wiz, W-I-Z. They're available at Home Depot and stuff. And they also can work um, and be controlled by Control 4. So um, that's how you'd probably have to do that. Does there need to be, and we, we've talked about this brief, brief, briefly in the past because I've got kind of the same situation in the theater right now, right? Where I've got, I've got nine lights in there and it would be nice to be able to like have a, have a lighting scene where you know the ones up by the screen are pretty dim and the other ones are brighter so what what i've settled on doing in the theater is i literally unscrewed the bulbs <laughs> from whatever five of the nine fixtures uh because i don't want that much light and even and i don't want them all dimmed to the same level which still puts light kind of shining on my screen because the lighting system wasn't designed for a theater. It was designed to be a gym room. Um, with the hue stuff, with the hue stuff or other options, can you do that? Does there have to be a controller or do you just, um, there's a little, hue, the bulbs? Uh, there's a little hue uh, bridge. That's uh, a piece that just has to plug in to your uh, network switch. And that's usually, I mean, it would probably hit your whole house for range, pretty good range. Mm. And then, um, so control four talks to the bridge and then, you know, <laughs> the bridge tells the light bulbs what to do. Um, so in, in operation, it looks like you're talking directly to the light bulb. That's just the interface. So yeah, you'd have to switch over to those light bulbs unless you can rewire. I mean, the best thing to do is wire different zones and have them on different switches. Cause then everything we talked about here is in play. Um, the Wi-Fi light bulbs, they do work well. They change colors, too, if you want them to. Um, <clears throat> you do have an extra layer. So Control 4 is talking to the hub, and the hub's talking to the light bulbs. So, you know, there's more room for, you know, something to drop offline or, you know, have connection issues. But in general, it does work pretty well. What you would do in your room or, or auto is if you did that, um, <clears throat> instead of using a dimmer at the – you know, at the light switch location, you'd probably want to change that. You'd probably want to wire that to be hot all the time. So instead of the switch breaking, you know, the electricity going to the lights, the electricity just goes straight to the light bulbs all the time. And then in its place, you can use a six button keypad. And then those buttons can be used to operate the lights as well as your remote control and your touch screen and your app and all the other devices for control four. <laughs> and mm -hmm. while well, six buttons, you could do quite a bit of, um, programming for nine or 10 lights with some colors and you know with the triple taps and double taps and single yeah. taps and all that kind of stuff you could definitely um have those in in groups that are more functional yeah i've i've thought about i've thought about putting a keypad in the theater anyway because um i've got in my theater i've got two i've got a dub, double gang box or double switch box because that room had a ceiling fan it had one lighting switch one one lighting zone and then the ceiling fan but when yeah. we converted the room to the theater i took the fan out capped it off in the ceiling and then pulled the switch out so there's one blank in there mm -hmm. and 
it would be it would be nice to have a keypad on that wall just in case something happened or you know that would give me the ability to to choose apple tv or kaleidoscape it would give me the ability to hit different lens memories and do do a couple of other things yeah and then As there well. you know keypads are nice too like just on the way in instead of coming in and sitting down and getting the remote and picking something on your way in, you could just hit your Apple TV button. And yeah. while, you know, everything starts firing up before you even, you know, get planted and right. get your remote in your hand. It's, I mean, it's, it's just a convenience thing, but it is pretty nice. Yeah. We tend to turn the room on. We kind of, usually we know we're going down there. And so we'll tend to turn the room on upstairs. Mm -hmm. Um, and then everything's everything's on by the time we get down there, but not always. So actually, one of the things that I had, I, I don't think it's in here now, but I had had in the config in the programming for a while is in the theater for this light. If you take the top, right, um, a single tap by default, because it's a light switch, will turn the light on. But right. I, I don't have it in here, but I had coded in here before the uh if you double tap right put the apple tv on mm -hmm. and if you triple tap put the go to the kaleidoscape there so even even without um even without a button keypad the light mm -hmm. switch can intelligently do things yeah so that's there yeah there's hidden kind of basically virtual keypad <laughs> buttons on every every dimmer for light switch so a lot of times what we'll program is um let's say we got a you know a lot of lighting zones <laughs> in a kitchen where there's a you know a lot of different lights and when you're walking out of there sometimes we'll do a double tap on the bottom to shut the whole room off so that light switch still is doing one thing you know it's mm -hmm. operating on one light but then we can give it a, a global control and you can do the same thing when you walk in double tap and it executes a lighting scene. You can do that even without a keypad right on the lights, which is like you were saying. Yeah. Stuff like that is handy, like upstairs in your bedroom as well. Mm -hmm. I should probably do. I don't think I have this coded in, but like with the master bedroom, do a double tap just shuts everything off. So you forgot to turn something off in the house right. and you know, you're going to bed, forget walking downstairs to go do it. Just boom boom yeah and you can you can bring the whole house down just like that uh some people with an alarm system will do um like a double tap um on a light switch either up or down to arm the system or and the opposite to disarm the system so from anywhere in the house instead of going mm -hmm. to the keypad or pulling your phone out you go to any light switch and double tap and you know arm or, or disarm the alarm and with that, um, so the engraved keycaps, you know, like, so your light switch says, you know, main lights, if that's lit up, you know, with a, a white backlight, let's say some, we, we program the alarm when it arms, it changes that to like orange or red, or it changes the LED, you know, from its, you know, normal mm -hmm. color to orange or red, just to show you, and it can do that, oh, yeah. you know, through the whole house to give you status mm -hmm. of what's going on. So alarm is one. Sometimes we'll add a button for door locks that, you know, when you press it, it'll lock the door. When you press it again, it'll unlock the door. <laughs> but more importantly, the LED on that button changes from green to red or whatever your, mm -hmm. your colors are indicating what it's what it's doing. So you can just look, you know, like in a bedroom, you just look at your keypad and you can tell that the door is locked, the garage door is shut or, you know, anything like that. Yep. A couple other lighting program things that are in here as well as like the... Um... Um, I can actually show this. It's on the, on the locks. So the front door lock, when it's unlocked, right? We turn we turn outside lights on. So if you envision the situation where it's nighttime, it's dark outside, the the deadbolts are locked, and then we need to go out on the back porch or or um, open the front door. You know, forgot to grab the mail or something. Which, which would be perfect for this, right? If it's nighttime, boom, turn the porch on and turn the foyer light on. And then when that deadbolt is locked, turn the porch light back off again. So we do that on the, on the front and the back door. And then in our mud hall, um, in our mud hall, I think there's the, there's the trigger for that door itself. 
Yeah. If the mud hall door opens and it's nighttime, turn on the lights in that hallway because it means we're getting home late from mm-hmm. being gone somewhere and you don't have to stumble into a dark room and try to find the find the switch or whatever to turn it on. Yeah. That's what's really cool about tying the alarm system to control four because you're able to program off all the sensors. Um, if you don't have an alarm system, you can still add sensors, you know, uh, case by case. So there are little, little baby battery powered door sensors, window sensors, tilt sensors, all that kind of stuff um, that talks directly to control four. So uh, you can do these kind of features either way. And what else is in here? So I think I've got like the email notifications on the sub pump. You know, if it detects water, mm-hmm. right? If the, when the sub pump senses water, send yes. us an email. Can it do text messages as well? Yeah, that's a push notification. Well, and it's okay, actually so. not a text message. It's um, the push notification like you get um, on the on the front of your phone from the app on the phone. Okay. Popped up. And it's yep. generated by the app. So as long as the app is installed on the phone. <laughs> You can turn that okay. off and on, you know, per phone or, or, you know, whenever you don't want to get notified, you can always turn it off. But if you have notifications right. enabled, it'll pop it up. It'll pop up. Another thing the push notification can do is um, <laughs> if, if you're just trying to keep tabs on like, you know, who's coming and going in the house or whatever off of the garage door opening or um, somebody typing in their code on one of the locks, if there's a camera nearby, it can not only, you know, push notify the script that you wrote, like garage door has been open, but it can also send you a snapshot from the camera. So you can actually, so for a garage, you know, if somebody pulls up in your driveway and opens the garage door, it'll send you a snapshot of the, of the driveway right on, right on the front of your phone. If you press and hold that, it'll actually open up the control four app and take you to the camera. So that's, that's some cool stuff you can do with push notifications. Yeah, I haven't I haven't coded those in. I'll have to add those in parallel to where I put the email notifications. Actually, probably with the push notifications, the emails are almost. If it's something well, you really I, want to loop back on and, and yeah. make sure you don't lose it, then you you would you could definitely do both. Do both. Because a push notification is just like anything else <laughs> on your phone. Once they yeah. disappear, once you swipe them away, they're gone yeah. for good. <laughs> That's true. So yeah. you know, if you need an archive of what's been happening, the email's better for that. Or if it's something that's non-pressing, you don't need to know <laughs> what's happening right now. Email is great because you can look at it whenever. The push notification is going to pop right up and interrupt your phone. Anything in the test room that you wanted to highlight? Um, I'll just go over a couple of these. Um, so room control is a driver, which is pretty <laughs> cool. Um, it, it basically affects uh, lighting and then also you know AV stuff. So rather than doing all the programming um manually this this has a lot of programming built in so for instance if i want to tie take a button and do room off um instead of making a macro and tying lighting scenes and you know turning off audio i can just basically check off properties in this and and say when room off is hit i want to turn off audio and video and lights or lights and um it it just it it's a real good shortcut on um on room room level controls. The other thing it can do is if you're using a six button keypad and you want to, you know, queue up some music and you're using the apps that stream right out of control four, you can have up to five things on one button. Um, so let's say you walk in, you got a button that says Pandora. You, let's say you got a button that just says, you know, Jeremy for your music. Mm-hmm. If you hit it once right here, you can define what, what uh, service and what station you want to pull up. So maybe it's Pandora and your favorite station. If you hit it a second time, it'll cycle to the next one and so forth. <clears throat> um, this can be set up to change the color of the LED too. So you can kind of go through, you know, channel one is red, channel two is blue, <laughs> channel three is green. And so you kind of know what you're doing. And then once you get through the list, if you only have one button to play with, you hit it again and it can shut, you know, shut it off. So mm. for things that you do all the time, you just want to cycle through a couple of choices. You can get all that stuff down to one button. Um, and then in programming, this speeds up. Like if I want to do volume control or play pause or any of that kind of stuff, that gives us all the connections to, to do that without having to manually write the whole, the whole program. So uh, room control is real cool for that. Um, let's see. 
Uh, since <clears throat> since we got the halos, the next two we should we talk about real briefly. So scenario is basically going to create a button on your remote. Um, <clears throat> it has to it it's going to be on anything that has a screen. So the app or the or the um, either of the halos, and you're basically going to name that button. So uh, let's say I want to do um, what did I have for mine. So let's say we want to do, uh, I want to be able to turn on and off camera notifications. Um, so, you know, either I want to monitor every every time the camera gets motion, I want to get a notification or, you know, I, I want to do not disturb my <laughs> mode where I don't have mm. a bunch of things popping up on my screens or whatever. I can name this button. <laughs> I would name it notifications. And then... Um, I can program to where if I press the button and it shows that it's on, it'll light up. If it's on, then it's going to let notifications through. If I turn it off, you know, in programming, I'm going to tell it don't, don't send notifications. So that's really good for like a do not disturb button. Or it really can be used for anything. Um, the, the garage I was working in today, which is kind of like a clubhouse that has a whole bunch of TVs that all have individual control, but uh, I use that scenario button. I made one that's all TVs, you know, go to Apple TV one mm -hmm. and then I got all TVs off. So instead of, you know, the client, you know, going to four mm -hmm. different, four or five different TVs and turning them on, I was able to uh, give them, you know, one button to turn them all on and go to the same course, <laughs> one button to turn them all off, just a real easy, basic control. And the cool thing is um, you can have that literally do anything and it'll show up on your touch screen and it'll it'll light up and, and go dark, you know, depending on its state. So it's giving you feedback as well. Hmm. So anything you want to do that's special, that's not already built in or, you know, isn't on, um, you know, one of the agents already, we can add anything we want on our button like that. Um, <clears throat> for the halo, um, this will show up and this will actually let you add, you know, custom things onto that screen. Um, because custom buttons, you know, the drop down menu from the custom button agent that won't show up on, um, on anything but a touch screen. So that'll show mm -hmm. up on your app and your halo touch, but it unfortunately just isn't the right format to go onto a static screen like the halo, but these custom buttons will. So mm -hmm. that's, okay. that's kind of, that's why right now it might be important for people getting their halos up and running if they want to put something special on there. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what that does. The next one down is called custom button. And it's basically the same thing. But instead of just having an on and an off property that you can either get status or fire commands from, it's got all these different, the button will light up all these different colors. So if you have to cycle through a bunch of things, if you keep pressing that button, it'll keep going through these colors. And each one of these can, can go to something else. Uh, so uh use case might be your home theater and it's got four different surround modes that you like to toggle between so you can do a custom button that says surround modes and you can cycle through <laughs> red blue green purple and it'll just keep looping back and forth and each one of those is going to queue up a different sound mode so it's a, it's a way to get a lot of functions onto one button um you can yeah. have and we've never, I've <laughs> never used all these colors, but you know, we'll, we'll choke that down to two or three or four different colors. And in the properties, you can tell it which ones you want to use. And then um, th this could also be used for something like going through Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. So you could do Netflix in red, Hulu and green, Amazon and blue, mm -hmm. and you could cycle through things like that. <laughs> you know, you, the, what you use them for is, you know, up to your creativity, but um, that's what, that's another way where you can get more functions onto a halo. And of course it works on the screens as well. So those are some pretty cool, uh, kind of, you know, not often used, um, drivers, at least for home does programmers. This, does the custom button have a, um, lag option? I'm not seeing it in here. Like, so say for example, I had like four options that I wanted to have on the button and I wanted to cycle them. But like, I know I want to get to the third one, but I don't want to like actuate one and two. Yeah, you don't want to skip through the two to first. Three. So if I do um, tap, 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 I can get to No, the third not one. really. Because this that is mainly be... just to cycle through a bunch of things and the order is always going to yeah. be the same. Yeah. Um, once okay. you get into where you need specific <laughs> things like that done, 
<laughs> then I would recommend using something with a, an actual touchscreen, like a Halo Touch. Yeah. Um, this is more for basic, you know, basic quick controls. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, <clears throat> although you can adjust, you know, how many of those colors it cycles through and what order they go in and what they do. You can, you can adjust all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is, um, and, and, and the programming portion of it is super powerful. So like you can even say when I touch this button and it goes red, <laughs> I want this and this and this to happen. It doesn't always have to be something direct. Um, so yeah, those are those are some pretty useful buttons on that list. Um, let's yeah, snapshot is awesome. Okay, so snapshot. Um, <clears throat> if you don't want to over automate things, snapshot might be the ticket. So, for instance, if when your alarm goes off, you've programmed it to turn lights on and um, <clears throat> God, I don't know what else. Uh, uh, Let's do this. Um, let's say you were tied to a um, a smoke detector on your alarm panel. And when the smoke detector goes off, you program, if it's at night, I want to light up, you know, all the lights to 20% and I want to unlock the doors and open the garage door. And, you know, so the thinking being, if, you know, if you got a fire in the house, you want everyone to be able to get up and see without getting blinded. And you want them to be able to get right out of the house, you know, without any anything, you know, slowing them down, like locked doors or whatever. That's all well and good, but let's say, for instance, uh, somebody just, you know, blew out a candle and, you know, you had kind of a false alarm. What you would mm -hmm. do there is you would program the snapshot to take a snapshot first of your whatever state your system was in. And then if it detects smoke, then do all this, you know, safety programming. But then um, <clears throat> you would either have a button your custom button to, you know, to revert back to its state that the mm -hmm. snapshot was taken, or you could have it manually after, you know, a minute or two, go back to its, uh, its snapshot state. So it'll capture mm -hmm. all your lights, all everything that was happening before the event. And then it can go right back <laughs> to that so that you're not over there trying to turn off 25 different things mm -hmm. <laughs> in a situation like that. So snapshots, you can use it for all kinds of stuff. In my system, um, my main theater is is my family room, which is open to the kitchen. So, um, you know, the, the rare times I get to <laughs> uh, blow off work and watch a movie during the week, which is almost never. But, you know, on the weekend, let's say we're doing Saturday afternoon, we want to watch a movie. I've got a movie time button. And <clears throat> what that'll do is um, when I hit the button, first it takes a snapshot of the state of my room. So, you know, maybe I got some kitchen lights on the family room um, lamps are on or whatever, it'll snapshot and record that status. <clears throat> um, if it is daytime, it'll close the shades and it'll dim the lights down to my movie um, advanced lighting scene settings. And then um, when the movies, you know, we watch a movie for a couple hours and it's done. When I turn movie mode off, if it is, um, if it's still light out, it'll, it'll raise the shades back up and it'll put all the lights back to the way they were. Mm. I have that daytime programming in there because if while I was watching the movie, it turned to nighttime yep. and I turn that button off, it won't raise, you know, it'll leave the shades down because they would have come down anyway. So you can do stuff like that. Um, mm. Snapshots, extremely powerful and uh, again, only limited by your creativity, but you can mm -hmm. save and recall a snapshot anytime you want. And occupancy. Okay, that's great. Um, occupancy is basically um, the, a program written <laughs> to simulate that you're at home when you're uh, out for the day or on vacation or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I'll usually, um, you will, we'll sometimes call this vacation mode. We'll put a vacation button on a, on a keypad, um, you know, usually by the, the garage exit to the house. And what this does is it lets you cycle through three things. Um, we'll do the keypad button black, which means it's not running. If you press the keypad button again, it'll go red, which means it's recording. So it'll take about two weeks and it'll record kind of your habits for lighting. You can choose to include whatever lights you want. So if you don't want it turning a bunch of lights on that no one can see from the outside, you can leave those off. Um, you can also throttle back how bright they are. So most people <clears throat> would take some 
you know, some scattered lights around the house and we'll cap it off at like maybe 30%. And um, it'll record your, your general use of how you use those lights while you're at home. And then when, when it's done recording and in kind of taking a sample of how you use the, the lights, it'll simulate a program that's similar to that, but it's different every day. So when you hit the button again and it goes green, meaning, you know, that, that vacation or occupancy mode is on, then um, while you're away, it'll, it'll randomly turn some lights on in a similar way that you would, you would have done if you were home. It really simulates like there's people in the house rather than putting lights just on a schedule, which is easy to watch and, and figure out that it's on a schedule. So occupancy is 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 great for um, people that travel or um, even if you're gone for a long day and it's going to be dark before you get home, it'll kind of keep the house alive. Case Worst case scenario, somebody's, you know, watching your house. Um, you can also tie it to your alarm state. So you can have it automatically run when you're in your alarm away state if you like it running all the time. Or you can just leave it manual control like we do sometimes. That's cool. And that's, that's pretty and built in. So anytime you're doing lighting um, and or TVs, um, that's just waiting to be programmed um, in the system. <laughs> There's a couple other boring ones. If you need a countdown for something, this is good. Um, this would be good for like a light that you want to turn on and <laughs> after a certain amount of time, turn it off. Um mm. With some of these drivers, these are called experienced drivers, so they'll actually generate their own icon on the screen. And anything that has a timer or a countdown on these type of drivers will actually show you how many minutes is left. It'll it'll tick mm -hmm. down, kind of like um, the little red uh, <laughs> dot when you get a text message and it shows you have something in there. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like that. It, it ticks down until it, it turns off. Um, there's one for announcements on and off, so that's like the do not disturb button if you have um, your doorbell or other notifications that play through the announcements in your speakers. We can embed programming so that they only play when this one is on. But if you, you know, somebody's going to take a nap or something, you hit that button and it, you know, it'll make sure nothing, nothing plays through for the announcements. Um, you have certain things sometimes. Let's see which one this, I should have renamed that one. This one is actually called uh, Universal Connections or universal adapters, what that's called. And um, there are times where the drivers don't have the right connections between, um, you know, the device and what you're connecting it to. So before this existed, <laughs> there was really no way to add a, add a component. So for instance, sometimes we've got like a TV and we <laughs> want to backfeed audio to the main audio system. The TV only has an optical digital output but we want to connect it back to our, um, <clears throat> our multi-zone music system, which only has analog uh, inputs, not optical. So easy enough, we get a little adapter, it takes optical and turn, turns it into analog and we can get it connected just fine. This little piece now we need to put into the program. So it'll give us that interface. It gives us all the different formats of inputs, all the different formats of outputs. And now in the program, I can connect those together Whereas before we couldn't do that. So that's kind of a little problem solver if, you know, if, if your connections don't match. Got it. Um, okay. Extract fan. That's what it's named, but it's basically for like um, exhaust fans. Uh, so bathroom fans. We would rename that, you know, bathroom fan or, or um, toilet fan or whatever, whatever you guys call it. <laughs> And instead of just having that on a, you know, like we may have a control for a light switch to turn, a, you know, a, a, an exhaust fan on and off, but this will actually give your, your icon of the fan on your screens and it'll do that countdown timer too. So we'll put these mm -hmm. in bathrooms sometimes um, and it'll say bath fan and give you the little fan icon. And when you, um, first of all, for programming, if you turn the fan on, we can have it be at like a 20 or a 30 minute timer. And then it'll automatically turn off. That's a property right here in the driver. Um, secondly, on the touchscreen, it will show that little dot with the countdown time, which is kind of cool. And you can you can override it or do whatever you want to right off the screen. So those are available for a lot of different you know things that that have timers now, um, fireplaces, um, exhaust fans, security lighting, stuff like that. So there's some new drivers that you know just make it a little more useful on the screens. 
And last one is kind of boring, but <laughs> nobody seems to know about this one. Um, if you've got uh, multiple <laughs> dimmers, but it's all one big area and you want it to, you want them to turn on together all the time on and off together and to dim up and down together. You can do that with a lighting scene, but if you'd prefer mm -hmm. just to have, you know, one icon and one light switch or, or both light switches do the exact same thing and not have to do any programming, you can group multiple dimmers uh, into all together. So they all operate together up and down, mm -hmm. which is really cool. You can go to the dimmer on either side of the room it turns on both zones, and if you press and hold one, they you know both they both dim up and down together. They both both turn on and off together. So that's a way you can consolidate multiple things that would normally show up separately <laughs> in into one you know one device on your screen just to really clean things up. Neat. So there's a whole bunch more drivers like this in, in there, um, all kinds of cool little useful things, and um, these are just a couple examples. Yeah, I'll have to think about some of these. The uh, I have a couple I want to put in your house, like for the fireplace and stuff. So <laughs> well, the, the one you're working on now has has had an evolutionary update, and <laughs> I think you're going to like the new one a lot. Hmm. Cool. All right, we're coming up on two hours, and I think we've, we've been through the whole gamut. Um, I don't know if, if folks have put a call for any last questions, comments, if there's something that uh, you missed or want to kind of go back. Uh, looks like and, Benny's uh, got one um, about Hughes. Um, can Hughes slow down or do a slow dim like theaters? I believe so. I think the Hue itself can do that. And if the Hue can do it, then through Control 4, you can you can make that happen as well. Set the timing. Yep. And yep, do an HD, I believe, is is approved. Or I mean is uh, authorized driver, so that works. Julius is asking, is simple system control four is a little overkill. Uh, looking for, for sub control four options. <clears throat> um I've not heard of this one, this sofa baton. That's how yeah, you say it. I, I don't have a super great impression of the other folks I know that have tested those. Okay. Um, but I maybe that data is out of date and it's come along a little bit. I feel like there's a handful of like Kickstarter type of um, programmable remote options that are around, but I'm not super versed on. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't even heard of that one yet. Um, I'm going to look <laughs> it up real quick. Control 4 just came out with a control. Uh, it's a Core 1 Lite is the controller, and it's actually made for real simple one-room systems. Um, and it's bundled up with um, the, um, the original SR260 remote, which is actually still very functional. Um, it just doesn't look as cool as the Halo, but it works real good. So let me look this up real quick and get pricing since he was asking about uh, since julius was asking about something that's a little more basic um and i forget what pricing is on this so i'm going to look it up because that's kind of the the answer to the the harmony type system Alrighty. One light. <laughs> they just released these so um as bundles okay so core core one light which is a little baby ba basic uh control four processor with a handheld remote is down to 849 retail price oh wow and um that is actually with the rechargeable remote so um it's the it's the old sr260 but um <clears throat> it's the nicer version that's got a dock and a rechargeable battery so you're getting down into the if if you had any of the other standalone remotes like um, any of the nicer harmonies with a base station that, that ties into the um, equipment or a, like a URC brand or an RTI, you're in that basic um, price range, which is like you know four hundred to nine hundred dollar range for something like that. 
Um, that's the core light. You can get it with a halo. You can actually still get it with a Neo. I think they have a few of those they're trying to get rid of still. Um, but you can get it with the, the real uh, inexpensive one is the one with the SR um, 260, which is the hard button <laughs> remote with a little tech screen on it, which still actually operates really well. So this has you know, three IR serial. So yeah, this will still do out. IP control on a, you know, a bunch of devices. Um, it still has an on-screen output. So you get the control for home screen on your TV screen, which lets you browse music. Um, <laughs> you know, um, it lets you pull up all the same stuff that's on the app pretty much, but on your TV screen. Um, it's got, I mean, they took some stuff off that we rarely need to use on the, you know, the little one, one room systems. So, um, <laughs> it, it was nothing important either. So this guy still works great. This would absolutely kill for one room and you can still add, you know, a handful of lights and a thermostat and, you know, that kind of stuff to mm -hmm. it. It doesn't have to just be for, for one room, but you know, it's kind of marketed as a one room starter system. Yeah, as long as you can get to the what you're controlling via IP, you should yeah. be able to. So that's, I guess that's uh, for for Julius. That's what I would I would look look at. If you drop below this, I mean, there's some other things that are in a similar price range, like the URC remotes. Um, <laughs> but you do lose a ton of functionality. Um, you know, they're really remotes that have to be programmed on site, and you know, there's, there's no logging in. And I mean, you know, it's, it's really just a remote that's shooting out commands. Whereas this is actually like a little automation system. So it's, it's different in that way. Um, I think um, this is a ton of value for 850 bucks to get started off with that would, um, would be appropriate for most systems with, um, you know, a TV and a an home theater system. Yeah. Especially useful if you've got multiple um, video sources and things that you're wanting to unify. Yeah, for sure. Which I think you, I'm pretty sure he does. He's got a variety of, of mm -hmm. sources that that would help with. You know, and then the, the, the free uh, <laughs> way to control things is, is arc audio return, return channel with, you know, with CEC, which is the, the, you know, controls over HDMI. Unfortunately, that is, really inconsistent on how well it works and it's super glitchy because you know it's a protocol but you know every manufacturer kind of implements it a little differently and there really is no adjustment setting <laughs> so you know even with um a system that's a, a tv something to play apps and a receiver <laughs> sometimes that doesn't even work reliably with arc so um mm -hmm. you almost have to add some kind of remote in to make it really streamlined and easy to use, even if it's a pretty straightforward system. Um, and th this would be the one that I would recommend. Just to clarify too, Otto's asking if you can use the touch, that should be yes. a yes, right? You uh, absolutely can, yep. So they haven't bundled it with the touch yet, but if anybody asked me for a, a core light and a touch, I would just, I would, you know, I would order the bundle and, you know, minus off whatever remote it came with and just put the touch in in its place and still it would still have a lower price than a traditional core one and a, and a touch. So, yeah, absolutely. The touches are still like literally they only started shipping in the last couple of weeks. So they'll be right. spool, spooling up mm -hmm. uh, on those. Um, creative tech is hey, what does the two-way feedback for volume look like on the halo touch remote can you configure what it looks like well if i change the volume in my living room it's a minus db number uh which let me see if that number corresponds to number on the oh wait i can't pull it up on the str this doesn't have a web ui so i can I tell you that's normally a function of the driver so um like receivers or amps that feedback the volume control they'll either go on a scale of zero to a hundred or they'll go on the scale where zero is reference level so everything below it is minus and everything above it is plus yeah and it'll 
that should do whatever the receiver is set to. Right. Yeah. The it's a different scale though, because the anthem, like mo most home theater stuff, like goes to, or it's minus dB. Right. Zero is reference, and then you're listening at minus dB. Right. From reference, but if I'm making this quieter, it's getting closer to zero. So it's it's like an opposite scale. So it's not exactly. Yeah. So that's set to zero, one hundred. That probably is a function of the uh, of the driver of the receiver. <laughs> sometimes it lets you change them. Sometimes it's it's stuck with zero to one hundred. Can you program it to always show to always show volume? I don't. Uh, no, it's a pop up. Yeah. The only thing you get is that always shows is like command and control stuff. So like the, whatever device you're on may have some context specific buttons that are there. The Apple TV doesn't have any hardly. Um, Kaleidoscape does though. It has two menus worth of buttons um, right. that show up. And I think other folks in the comments of the video that went up Monday were commenting that like with their cable boxes and stuff, they get, more things available to them yeah there's a whole bunch of extra buttons on cable boxes um <laughs> one one thing that's one thing is oddly missing from the halos is an info button mm. but um, yeah so i've already added the info button for cable boxes a bunch of times um as one of the custom buttons so mm -hmm. luckily you got custom buttons so you know if there's something in particular that doesn't come on the driver or isn't a button on the remote um, you yep. can add it as a custom button or a, or a custom button up on the, um, or, uh, the, like a experience button up on the screen. Yep. That's, that's one of the main things that I've added to the, um, to my custom button agents for the theater and the living room. Both is the, is the info pop-ups. Mm -hmm. Auto saying, does it have uh key or chi chi charging wireless charging? No, it's a, it has a dock. So you pop it in the dock, you get a little bling, and then it charges that way. But they do, these are interchangeable, so the docks mm -hmm. are the same. So yeah, that was much cool. as these remotes are different, the, the bottoms and the tops are the same. Mm -hmm. They have almost the same, pretty much the same profile and stuff. And they stand in like facing up so you can grab it right off and drop it right in. Any other questions? And then since they're new, the, you know, just to clear up the retail pricing, uh, regular halos are 550 retail and halo touches are 900 retail. So you could probably, after this um, is up, if you want, you can drop in a comment if you want to put your contact info in there. If anybody is interested to, to learn more or potentially you know, um, want to talk offline with Dan. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk up. offline or e answer emails as quick as I can. I'm always buried under paperwork, so <laughs> be, be just a little, little patient, but I'd be happy to get to that stuff. Um, if anybody's interested in the halo or something, um, something new like that, feel free to drop me a line too. Cool. One other quick note before we go, since we've been doing the This Week in Kaleidoscape um, little segment on the live streams, I did want to point out we've got a mega sale going on. Um, so we do have Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is up for pre-order. That just launched and... Uh, we got a couple new movies as well. Elemental is now available to watch. No hard feelings. And Hotel Transylvania 4 had been locked behind HBO Max for a long time. But now that's now that's available. But the Marvel movies, I was just chatting with some folks about this. If you've been if you're relatively new, I've got them all except for one. Um if you're a relatively new entry into Kaleidoscape, like these are the kind of sales that you want to jump on um so we've got i should show them all hopefully now there we go um whole marvel cinematic universe uh is on sale so 
open up those wallets and and grab uh grab the movies while they're hot um i did just pick up a couple of i thought there was one more um 4k upgrade that i had recently grabbed oh no yeah i bought enter the dragon of footloose just last week we just watched spider verse uh this week everybody was incredibly disappointed when the movie ended yeah there was groans <laughs> in the audience talk about a cliffhanger <clears throat> um and then now we're not going to get the third one for yeah the third one's delayed a long time maybe the end of next year or something let alone how long it might take to come out in the theater and then be watchable at home. But it's still a pretty, pretty exceptional movie. I thought that was really well done. We just watched uh, also Amazing Spider-Man 1. I never watched the two Amazing Spider-Man movies, but we're still on the oh, yeah. superhero kick. All right, two last questions, I think, and then we'll wrap it up. If there's any more, please post them now. Uh, Randman, welcome. It says cost to do one halo touch and one control room. Oh, so I think we might have got this, but just to reiterate. Um, All right, a core one and a halo touch retails <laughs> for about eighteen hundred. Although if we if we subbed in a core one light, it's going to go down <laughs> by a couple hundred bucks. So ballpark about sixteen hundred, and then as far as um, number of components. Um, yeah, I mean, what it's controlling is is going to affect how much it costs to program. Um, <clears throat> I would say we would do around 150 bucks to do a one room system on site, um, TV receiver, a couple of sources um, that take a you know an hour or two to you know um, connect and and program. And that would run somewhere around 150 bucks. That's going to vary depending on your dealer, though. But just for ballpark pricing. And then there is support, cross support for Lutron. Is that right? Uh, yeah, almost all the Lutron stuff. If if it's um, <laughs> if it's anything that uses the Lutron hub, whether it's a um, a raw two, a raw three, um, a raw two select, those are all the hubs that you need for um, app control of Lutron those all talk to control for so pretty much uh caseta <laughs> and anything above caseta is kind of like the you know the entry level home depot level brand of automated lutron lights so that level and anything above should be able to control in control four and it'll look exactly like control four dimmers it just has to go through that hub on the back end all right. And then one more question, David Kershaw. Can you show the dimmer configuration on light keypads? So I just went back to this. This is the property page for a regular, or you know, I guess just a standard control four dimmer switch. Um, so you can manage things like default uh, click rates, responses, the, the light itself on the keypad and how it shows. Um, and then you get all of the energy information and um, details the, uh, down below. The default on brightness is nice too, um, <laughs> because a lot of lights now, especially with LED lights, they're so unbelievably bright. <laughs> they're usually brighter than you need. So um, let's say in a room, you know, you turn the lights on, but you really only need them to go to 60 or 70%. You can put that percentage in that top um, property there for the default. And when you turn the light off and on, it'll just go between zero and 70. Um, so it, it lets you kind of cap off, you know, all the, all the brightness that you don't need. And then you can always still go to the uh, a screen and push it up to 100, or you can press and hold the top button and push it up to 100. So let's say you got to clean up and you need it super bright. Um, but you can, you can kind of change your property of, you know, how bright on is which is kind of nice. So let's see. So as I was trying to connect, connect a light to a keypad, assemble button one. So if you, I have a keypad in here as well. <coughs> um, 
You have so, to bind that, right? The dealer. Yeah, does? connections on keypads. I mean, the way they work the best is just to make a connection, and that's something the <laughs> dealer has to do because connections are not part of um, Composer Home. Um, you can kind of do it through programming, but it's it's like you know five or six programming steps instead of just one. And it's a little clunky because you got to program what the button does, <laughs> and then how the LEDs of the button react, and you'd be absolutely better off getting um your your dealer to log on for five minutes and make the connection for you because then you're you're yeah. bulletproof from there on yeah so these so Dan, he he did it for these and if i look at like the the keypads you know in the kitchen here main lights island lights cabinet lights sink lights dining table lights mud hall lights all six of these are are bound so I can tap them, tap it, turn on, tap it, turn off. But because of that binding with no programming, I can hold and they will ramp, dim, dim ramp up and down as well. Yeah, these keypad buttons take every single property <laughs> that's set up in the dimmer, which, which <laughs> makes them function absolutely perfectly. Yeah, but that has to be a connection um, done by the yeah. dealer. Uh, Randman, so I think Randman came in late. Can you oh, yeah. control four also handle Phillips Hue? Um, it does. Yep. Um, it, it connects through the um, through the Phillips Hue hub or network hub, and it pushes through most of the functions to control four. And at that point, you can tie them to buttons. You can have them on the control four screen. You can do lighting scenes, all all the same stuff. <laughs> yep. If you rewind a bit, we talked. Um, talked about that more at length and the whole idea of like you have one lighting zone on one switch but it has multiple lights how to you know what what are the options and how does that how does that work so that's probably something i may end up doing in in my theater room even because like i said i want to be able to independently control them without just having them off because i don't want the whole i don't want all the lights in the room at the same level of brightness all right, and we're we didn't talk about it, but Control Four does linear lighting too. So you know, tape light mm -hmm. um, natively now with full control of the color wheel <laughs> and the brightness, and it's it's very cool. And that's actually pretty easy to add after the fact because um, instead of having to run a wire back to you know traditionally where you can hide power supplies and controls, um, they really only need to be powered, so they can be hidden in cabinets and you know behind. Uh, base trim and stuff like that. So um, we didn't talk at all about that, but there's a whole um, suite of options for tape lighting now. Perfect. All right. I think we can probably call it. Um, if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to post them, of course, in the comments of the video. Um, we'll both keep an eye on that and, and yeah, I'll try to take a look to answer that. anything else. Um, so I think hopefully we just created the the best, most detailed treatise on Control Four. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot out there on online. on Composer, is there? Mm -mm. So hopefully this this video. I've been wanting to do this one for a while, so hopefully this stands for for a long time. People looking for information on the platform, and um, of course anybody watching, if you have more topics related to this stuff that I can make you know, content about that we can have discussions about like this Q and a sessions and whatever. Um, let me know the, the video showing off the two halos and really comparing and contrasting why you may want one or the other is up, uh, that from, from this live stream, that video was up a couple of days ago. So that's there. Um, pretty detailed take on that spoiler alert. I'm going to keep the touch. Um, and yeah, a bunch of other content is made um, coming soon. Hopefully, we'll have some more special guests coming up. If all of this information is helpful to you, um, not too proud to say, leave some super thanks, leave some super chats or uh, super stickers and all that. They're always very much appreciated. And all that money will go back into doing more stuff um, on the channel. So any uh, final thoughts or takeaways, uh, Dan? Well, uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, but Composer Home is is a piece of software you do have to purchase. Um, 
but it's a one-time fee and it's, you know, it'll, it'll get up upgraded with your system for free for the life of the system. Um, you can bundle it with the foresight service. So foresight is a service that you need to do anything remotely with control Four. So to use your app when you're not, you know, on site, um, that all happens through foresight. That's the only annual fee control Four ever charges. I think it's 120 bucks a year. Um, but it opens up push notifications, um, using the app while you're not home, um, several other things as well. Um, you can bundle that with Composer Home and it gets you Composer Home for like 50 bucks instead of, you know, 150 bucks or what it would cost standalone. So that's that's the, the real smart way to get it because you, you probably will need um, Foresight anyway. So you can bundle those together. And once you have it, you can use it anytime you need. Um, and I just, I always recommend find a good dealer you enjoy interacting with and, and you trust and um, <clears throat> that'll overcome, you know, any of the issues people, you know, do it yourselfers have with, with control four and not being able to control a hundred percent of it. But, you know, if you find someone you work well with um, it's usually not an issue at all going forward. Yeah. For the remote access, the foresight thing, I can say I've, I've subscribed to that the whole Time that we've had the system um it's the kind of thing that's invaluable when you need it particularly when you um you know something happens at your home and you're not there um we use we use that all the time even even from the perspective of like you know we're out with the parents or something and somebody's going back to the house and we need to stop at the grocery store so just go ahead and open open the garage or unlock the doors um, stuff like that Yep, exactly. Well, thanks a lot for having me on again. And yeah, uh, good time. I'm uh, I'm happy to help out uh, your viewers, um, however, with questions, <clears throat> or whatever you need. So feel free. Cool. Yeah, we'll be back again so we, with uh, with another topic, I'm sure. Well, thanks everybody, and thanks uh, David on the way out here. Uh, the super sticker, way to go! Thank you, thank you so much. All right, we'll be back, folks. Check out the videos and. Uh, Thanks so much. Take care.